I think we yeah, no are problem. going to start because we have a, a lot to go through. Um, good evening, everyone. And it's a great, great pleasure for me to welcome you all to this online book discussion for International Brigade Against Apartheid, Secrets of a People's War that Liberated South Africa. The book is edited by Ronnie Casdrolls with the assistance of Matt Anderson and Oscar Marlin and was published by Jacana at the end of last year, which also uh, marked the 60th anniversary of MK. Um, just a heads up that the meeting is being recorded and we'll upload the recording uh, uh, on the History Workshops YouTube channel um, in the next few days for future reference. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Arianna Lissoni. I'm a researcher based at the Witz History Workshop. And this webinar marks uh, the first in the History Workshop's uh, seminar series for the 2022 academic year. And so we're really excited to be jointly hosting this event with our colleagues um, at the Department of African Studies at the University of Vienna in collaboration with uh, Jacana Media. And we are very fortunate to be uh, joined by a form formidable panel of, of, uh, of speakers from amongst the book editors and contributors, and very much looking forward to hearing about the making of the book and the um, selection of the stories as well um, as about some of the individual um, stories of the women and men uh, that, that are in the book. Um, the title, of course, is an allusion to uh, the international brigades of the, during the Spanish Civil War. And these were the military units that were set up by, uh, by international volunteers that fought on the side of the, of the, Repu of the Republic against um, the fascist dictatorship of Franco. Uh, a precursor to this book, uh, the, the London recruits, um, uh, was published a few years ago and edited by uh, one of the London interna UK internationalists, um, uh, Ken Kibo, who's, who's with us in the audience tonight. Um, the, the current book contains over 60 narratives and personal testimonies by 33 different contributors and they chronicle and at the same time uh, pay tribute to uh, two parallel dimensions of international solidarity. The first is the secret of a clandestine work that was done um, by a small uh, but substantial group of very committed internationalists that was in direct support of the ANC and MK's armed effort. And the second is uh, the open solidarity, if you like, of the international anti-apartheid movement that was conducted through uh, boycotts, sanctions, and divestment campaigns. And while the book is primarily about international assistance to South Africa's liberation struggle, it also includes uh, several contributions from MK members that served in the forward areas and were serviced by the, the international machinery that the book is about. Um, so, so the aim of this event this evening is, and, and the discussion is really to try to link these historical experiences of international solidarity with contemporary struggles for freedom, particularly in Palestine, and hopefully inspire uh, new generations to take collective action. Um, before I, I go on and introduce the panel, I'd like to invite first the chair of the Witz History Workshop, Professor Noor Niftahudian, as well as our co-host, uh, Prof, Prof, Professor uh, Birgit Englert, uh, in the Department of African Studies at the University of Vienna um, to, to welcome you and share some initial thoughts on the book. Noor, over, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Ariana. And uh, I think good evening to most people. It's probably good morning to some people. Um, and first of all, uh, congratulations to Rani and other comrades who uh, contributed to the production of this really wonderful book. Um, I've got uh, two very brief uh, 
comments to make. The first, as Ariana has said, even though she has done so already, is to formally welcome you on behalf of the History Workshop. Uh, we're really very pleased to host this launch uh, uh, together with the colleagues from Vienna, but also uh, with Ronnie and uh, other contributors, or as I should say, comrades. Um, I just want to very, very briefly add to the key point that Ariana has made uh, about what I think is probably one of the salient contributions of the book, and that is about internationalism and international solidarity. Uh, internationalism, in my mind, uh, is probably one of the highest forms of commitment to emancipatory politics and struggles. Um, as this book so vividly underscores, uh, internationalism is principally uh, about the work and sacrifices of ordinary people, uh, women and men, uh, whose vision of freedom transcends borders. Um, and in this book, we have uh, some fine examples of uh, comrades uh, who were prepared to make enormous sacrifices uh, in uh, in a struggle for liberation in South Africa uh, and committed to internationalism, uh, often under very, very trying circumstances. Uh, history is, of course, replete with uh, extraordinary examples of such internationalism. Uh, Ariana has already referred uh, to the anti-fascist struggles in Spain. Um, I've, I recently read a book about how uh, French activists supported the FLN uh, from inside uh, France. Uh, and did very similar work to many of the comrades whose stories are uh, in this book. Uh, and of course, uh, also in Latin America, I think the anti-war movements are crucial examples of this kind of internationalism. Uh, and of course, the BDS campaign is perhaps the exemplar of such internationalism today. I think it's important that we have these histories, uh, not only to record uh, the important role of international solidarity in the anti apartheid movement. But as Ariana has said, it's important in this moment uh, because we are confronted uh, with, I would say, an urgent need uh, to remobilize the kind of internationalism that brought apartheid down, uh, that is mounting a significant campaign in support of the Palestinian people's struggle for liberation. But we also confront wars, climate change, inequality on a global scale that we've not witnessed before. And we cannot execute effective struggles against those global ills only on the basis of local and national struggles. We have to have uh, international solidarity, international struggles to confront those issues. After all, at the core of our problem is international capitalism, neoliberal capitalism. And we can only overcome that on the basis of an international struggle. I also hope, uh, this is really my, this is my last point, that the fantastic work that Rani and other comrades uh, have put into the production of this book will also inspire others, uh, hopefully younger researchers, to also shine uh, some light on other aspects of international solidarity. And I'm thinking here particularly about uh, the role of workers and trade unions in the countries uh, from where some of the comrades who feature in this book uh, were located. We organize strikes, I'm thinking of the dune strike in Ireland, the miners in the UK, but also many, many other places uh, who made enormous uh, um, sacrifices to establish direct links with workers in South Africa in order to organize international working class solidarity, to build trade unions inside the country uh, and to create the kind of international solidarity that in my mind uh, is core to overcoming global capitalism. Thanks, Ariana, and uh, well done, Ronnie and other comrades. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Noor. Um, over to you, uh, Birgit. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Ariana and uh, Rani, for uh, organizing this event. And it's a real pleasure for me from the University um, of Vienna to be able to join you in, in hosting it. Although my contribution was a very modest one and primarily I really have to thank Ariana for all the organizing work she has done. 
So uh, I just want to say very briefly that uh, this is actually not um, our first event on the international internationalists who helped to bring down apartheid in South Africa, but also last year we had the pleasure to organize together with Ronnie and Ken Keeble um, an event where um, actually 10 speakers were sharing their experiences and we <laughs> carried on for much too long and I think it will be uh, uh, yeah uh, not not that extensive tonight uh, but actually um, it was a pleasure to see that many of those contributors also um, shared their memories in written in the book and um, and many, many more, of course. And uh, I just want to add a few words uh, from the perspective of what this book um, brings to the discipline of African history and, um, and global history. And I think it, it is a lot. <laughs> it is a lot it has to offer because of those um, very um, personal accounts um, which give us really unique insights into what motivated people to join uh, the struggle into their um, day-to-day -day, um, choices they made and although uh, they all had to be very brief <laughs> Rani just gave them a couple of pages each still they managed to really bring about um, a lot of um, what drove them and um, also a lot of um, what happened afterwards uh, how they view South Africa today how they think about um, solidarities on a more global scale and um, as uh, Noor had just said, I think by doing that, they, they really managed to inspire younger generations to um, uh, reflect about their own capacities, <laughs> so to say. So I don't want to take much time. Uh, uh, I really think it's a book that uh, anybody interested in African history or global history more generally uh, should be reading. And I'll be certainly sharing it with my students uh, from this term on and I'm much looking forward to their responses and reactions. And um, yeah, and despite its impressive uh, 358 pages, <laughs> I think after finishing reading the book, you still feel like you want to carry on, you want to know more about those people. And so I just want to end by saying that I hope that uh, perhaps together with the history workshop, we might be able to uh, think about a project of oral history or whatever to, to carry on this important work to make those voices heard. So I'm um, much looking forward to learning more tonight. And thank you, everybody, for sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Birgit. Um, let me uh, then turn to introducing our panel, um, starting with, uh, with Ronnie Casrose, uh, whom, is, as uh, you, will, you will all know, is a struggle veteran, a former government minister and an activist for Palestinian rights. He's the author of four other books, also all published by Jakana, Armed and Dangerous, uh, The Unlikely Secret Agent, A Simple Man, um, uh, and Catching Tadpoles, uh, his, his uh, last one um, about his uh, memoir of his childhood and youth. Um, our next speaker, uh, James Nkulu, um, unfortunately for, uh, contacted me about half an hour before we started. He's had a family emergency, but I'm introducing him um, uh, as part of the panel. Uh, we might have to uh, adjust the order of speaking depending on when he's able to join us. Um, anyway, he's an MK veteran who served in Angola, Mozambique, Zambia, and Botswana. Uh, where he interacted with internationalists from the various countries, uh, from various countries who, have, who assisted uh, uh, MK operatives in, in dangerous missions and tasks. He participated in the negotiations for a democratic transition and was later elected as an MP and currently um, serves as um, on the ANC Integrity Committee. He's also the author of two books, uh, The Honor to Serve and um, Voices of Liberation, uh, Chris Hani. 
Uh, Riaz Saluji, our third speaker, was a member of MK from 1981 to 94. He was part of a team that was responsible for the integration um, of the various statutory and non-statutory forces. He held various position in, positions in the new South African National Defense Force and attained the rank of Brigadier General. He's worked extensively in the public and private um, defense and security environment, uh, locally, regionally, and internationally. Um, Marth Anderson is a Joburg-based writer and um, editor. He, she has a PhD in African literature from Wits University, and she conceptualized and project managed um, UNISA's history and memory project between 2008 and uh, 2015. Um, uh, lastly, uh, Ramzi Baroud is a US Palestinian journalist, editor and author. He's the editor of the Palestinian Chronicle, um, holds a, a PhD in Palestinian studies from the University of Exeter and has authored numerous books. His latest book co-edited with uh, Ilan Pape is a vision for liberation, engaged Palestinian leaders and intellectuals speak out. Uh, Dr. Baroud is a non-resident senior research fellow at the Center for Islam and Global Affairs. Um, so uh, we agreed each of the speakers will uh, provide an input of about 10 minutes. And after uh, uh, that, I will try to take a few uh, rounds of questions and comments from the participants. Uh, please feel free to put your comments in the chat. We have a lot of participants, so I may not be able to address everything that's been raised, uh, but I'll try uh, to pick on, on some of the conversations and comments and we'll then put these to the panel um, and allow them uh, to respond. Um, we originally scheduled the meeting to go on until half past seven, but I think we can continue a little bit beyond that if uh, if we've got a discussion going. So let's see how, uh, where that takes us. Um, so, Ronnie, it's over to you. Um, thanks very much. Thanks indeed. very much, Ronnie. Thank, thank you, Ariana, And uh, thank you to Wits University, History Workshop to African Studies, uh, Vienna University, to Jakarta, the publishers uh, who are here with us, and a very good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are, to all our good friends who are present here. It's a wonderful turnout, and one recognizes so many of you present, including contributors to books like this. The London Recruits has been mentioned. There are many of those dear comrades present, those who have contributed to this new book. Uh, and of course, there are so many books coming out written about the struggle here from various points of view. Um, to stress that um, in a book like this, one can't include everybody. Um, and uh, we have attempted to reach out as much as possible as we did with the London recruits. Um, and certainly there are many more testimonies that still need to come and must come. Um, the history is so important then and now, as Vijay Prashad said in one of his endorsements to this book, um, and uh, in terms actually of the history, I must say and greet as well a long lost friend who I've recently made contact with and who now is going to be published this book in both Kenya and Canada. He has feet in both countries and that's Feroz uh, Manji of Diraja Press. And you know, he has actually penned me a beautiful sentence about the book and congratulating us, all of us who have contributed, in which he says, um, the book is more than just a history. Uh, the appearance of the book is a um, historic achievement itself. It's a historic event itself. So those of you who practice the 
history, the narrative, the teaching, um, it's a wonderful reference to how vital history is to know the past for the present and the future. And this is really what the essence of the book is about. Um, it's really to give voice to those who played an important role from the internationalist point of view that Noor has so brilliantly referred to in terms of its vitalness and significance, its importance. And it was after the London recruits came out and is doing so successfully, um, I began to speak to others from many other countries, from North America to Africa, the frontline states, the rest of the continent, many more than who uh, appeared in the London recruits across Europe and indeed from Latin America to Asia, India and so on, former Soviet Union, the Cubans, uh, the Swedes. And the book had to deal with two particular aspects of uh, the pillar of international solidarity and the importance it played in the South African struggle, as it must in all struggles against racism, colonialism, oppression and exploitation. And that was given the nature of the anti-apartheid movement and its very singular focus on the South African struggle by people around the world who at the same time had been engaged so forcefully and brilliantly in solidarity with the people of Vietnam, with the people of Africa and the Middle East from Palestine to Algeria, um, the Southern African region of Angola, Mozambique, Polygaster, it's lovely to see you present here and all the work you did in solidarity with magic from Britain in those days, uh, Zimbabwe, Namibia, and so on. Uh, to bring this together meant a section dealing with something new in relation to the anti-apartheid movement in its public sense, um, and within it particular secrets and aspects of how that struggle had developed, but particularly another part of the story, very seldom written about or known, and that is those internationalists, as I've said, from across South Africa's very borders in the frontline states to the five continents, um, who came to the fore out of the anti-apartheid public solidarity and wanted to do more, were some of them working in the frontline areas from Mozambique to Botswana and Swaziland and Zimbabwe and so on, um, and others who actually joined from abroad and wanted to serve more directly in the clandestine struggle, gave such commitment and sacrifice Half a dozen of them or so were actually captured during the period and tortured and served sentences in prison, along with our own multitude of people and those of the armed and the political and trade union and the underground struggle in South Africa. Um, and this is where we came up with the idea of calling both the International Brigade and uh, Ariana has made reference to the International Brigade of the Spanish Civil War period. Oliver Tambo has referred to this pillar of our struggle as an unshakable bedrock. And it really references not just the incredible international solidarity, direct action that this book, um, that this book refers to and covers, but uh, the bedrock of internationalism throughout the world, I've mentioned Palestine, um, Vietnam, the struggles of Latin America and so on that, that Noor has referred to, the struggle of the people of, of Western Sahara, the Polisario of today, and, and elsewhere in a very troubled, critical time in the world, which, and I want to reinforce Noor's point about what is so vital in the world today, and hopefully the book inspires people to the beacon um, 
of international solidarity in action. The world needs it now more than ever. The world needs an important, an enormous peace movement to prevent the wars, the calamity, the aggression um, that we've been living through that has wreaked such havoc in countries such as Libya, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and so on, and fighting that's taking place today, um, reminding us of our humanity and our need to invoke what these brave, courageous contributors to this book illuminate. And that is the drive for such a high level of consciousness, of service, of care for others, as to ensure that we save this planet from all the calamities, including the climate change and the ecosystem, stemming clearly from the ravages of corporate capitalism, which is such a danger to us all. And this is where the inspiration of the book that we put across and the contributions of those uh, when you read them and hear their stories and many more stories must be inspired out of this, bring to us the inspiration that moved uh, the Spanish brigade, that moves those who fought, people who fought in alliance and unity against fascism in the Second World War and this wonderful period of revolutionary uprisings of the 20th century the anti-colonial struggles which were centered from Latin America to Asia to Africa itself. And the book pays important relevance and salutes those Africans and those countries of Africa and the comrades of Africa who were involved together with those of the other continents. I just want to make a very important point that's emerged from some of the people who have written to us with the uh, publication of the book, and quite a number made the point that how they hadn't realized the extent to which the African people of the neighboring states of South Africa had performed such important sacrifice and contribution to the struggle to overthrow apartheid. And you will see that in wonderful accounts of very modest, and they all very modest, the people who write, they didn't want to project themselves. I, I basically pressurized them to write. But these incredibly dignified patriots out of Maputo, out of Mozambique, out of Swaziland and Botswana and Zimbabwe, Zambia, Namibia and, and uh, Angola and further afield. Africa has showed the world a great deal about struggles for humanity and the rest of the world has shown Africa its solidarity, but it's a solidarity that we must build across all five continents. Thank you very much. I'm so looking forward to hearing everybody else and waiting for those questions. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Rani, and thanks for sticking to the time. I don't think uh, James and Kulu has made it yet, so let's move oh, oh, on to Riaz Saluji, please. Riaz. Uh, thank you, thank Ariana. You. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to, to all of you who have been responsible for making this event possible. I think it's really critical and important at this point in our history. Uh, Comrade Rani, uh, colleagues and, and comrades, I think uh, Comrade Rani has really contextualized the importance of, of, of this work and this book. And, uh, you know, I was thinking of how should I uh, approach this whole uh, event? And uh, I thought to myself, you know, many liberation struggles and revolution plays itself out at a strategic and at a tactical level. 
And, and we all know the strategic issues and what drives liberation, self-determination, and we're all familiar with those histories. I thought I'd, I'd maybe just concentrate a bit on the tactical level because often that is not a part of Britain history. And in this instance, I was part of, of that tactical approach as well. And, and I just want to make a few comments and then highlight the importance of internationalism and solidarity within the context of what we were involved with. So if you take this particular project, uh, you know, Africa Hinterland, it's often called Operation Lighty, the truck safari. I mean, you can imagine uh, an operation where for the first time in the history of, of, of our armed struggle, we were able to infiltrate that levels of of equipment and ordnance and weaponry into this country. It was unprecedented. One trip, one ton. I mean, over the seven year period, we had infiltrated almost 40 tons of weapons and ordnance into this country without a single casualty. And I mean, that is quite phenomenal in our history. And without detracting from some of the amazing successes of, of other MK operations, I think it's important to highlight this particular one because of, of another dimension. And that dimension was the role that the internationalists and the comrades, foreign nationals had played in the success of, of this operation. You know, an operation to infiltrate the quantum of ordnance, as I've indicated, was unprecedented in terms of, of its magnitude, its complexity, the level of operational security, intelligence, and range of participate, participants, and particularly the internationalists, both internationally, regionally, and locally. And, and, and this was driven by two factors. I mean, the one was really a, an objective factor. We had to do something different in order to confront the enemy, because it was becoming increasingly difficult to, to infiltrate larger quantities of weapons and ammunition into this country, given the apartheid infrastructure. So objectively, it was very difficult, and we had to find an objective response to this very difficult operational problem. But there was another element, and that was the subjective element. And that subjective element, and it showed the intrinsic racism and inability of the apartheid regime to understand our, our own resources and capability that the enemy would not for one moment think we were capable of such a daring and sophisticated operation. And in particular, the use of foreign comrades and internationalists. And in many ways, this particular dimension of, of this operation highlighted the critical success factor of that particular operation, without which we could not have achieved the strategic objectives of, of of the ANC and particularly of our armed struggle. And that was the use of international solidarity and those comrades who were prepared to make the ultimate sacrifice by contributing to the liberation, not only of South Africa, but in many other parts of the world. And the support and involvement of internationalists in our struggle generally, and more specifically in this instance, it highlighted and expressed the highest level of international solidarity. And, you know, in many ways, as I said, this was a critical success factor. And, and the scale with which we, we conducted the operation, how it was conceived in the first instance, and the fact that it it, it was conceived and implemented and operationalized across different continents uh, was quite remarkable. And of course, on a lighter note, this was all done without the sophisticated technology that we have today. There were no cell phones, there was no internet, there was no immediate communication systems that we could rely on. So the operational conditions were incredibly difficult. And this bears testimony to the ingenuity and, 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 and the amazing ability of all of those involved to be able to pull something like this off, you know. I mean, the ANC has always placed a very high value on the international solidarity. And it has always forged strong relations with fraternal liberation organizations. And we grew up in that environment. 
throughout the world. I mean, we grew up with, with understanding the causes of liberation and self-determination. We grew up and were schooled in a world where the PLO, the Vietnamese people, Polisario, Fratellin from East Timor, the Sandinistas, Prelimo, PAIGC from Guinea-Bissau, uh, MPLA, you know, Zapu, Zanla, uh, in Namibia plan. We grew up in this environment and, and, and that was what motivated us and inspired us and gave us moral and political impetus to continue our own liberation struggle. And this was fundamentally reinforced by the anti-apartheid struggle and international solidarity with, it, with which, which I don't think we would have been able to make the kind of strides we made within the time we were able to liberate our country. So we've got to pay tribute to the unsung heroes and particularly those from the international community who showed that level of sacrifice. And as I've said, unsung heroes, because we are very familiar, as Comrade Ronnie has said, about the overt political campaigns of international solidarity against apartheid. But we've not often heard about the clandestine activities that took place. And this is a, a very exemplary example of, of that particular element and dimension of our struggle. But what is more important in, 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 on a last note, that, that this initiative made it possible for our movement to arm our people in, in a way that what never happened before. Our army and the struggle against an enemy and for our people to defend themselves against the atrocities perpetrated by the apartheid regime. Uh, and we must also pay tribute, obviously, at the end of the day. And I think that is a very important element as well, is that all this initiative and the solidarity and the way in which we conducted ourselves and achieved it, at the end of the day, enabled our people, our soldiers, to defend themselves and take the battle to the enemy. And that was the real essence of our people's work. And in fact, towards the end, large quantities of, of that hardware that we had infiltrated into the country were, was able to equip our people to defend themselves right towards the end in relation to the self-defense units, to defend our people, our future democracy against the real onslaught that took place just prior to our democratic elections. So I want to say uh, to Comrade Ronnie and those involved, Muff and Oscar and all the other individuals and comrades who put this book together, you've left a legacy for future generations of freedom fighters and internationalists and hopefully show them the kind of commitment that is necessary to confront the real challenges that we are faced with during these very difficult times we are living in. People are still not free. Self-determination has still not been achieved. People in Palestine are still struggling and suffering. And we need to use these examples and we need to use the insightfulness of, of the content of this book to leave that legacy. And so hopefully in a very small way, all of us and particularly those, those comrades from abroad and other countries showed what what we can achieve if we all work in a united way towards our common goal of achieving a better quality uh, and a better life for humanity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Riaz. It's, it's over to you, Muff. Let me see. Um... Oh, here you are. <laughs> uh, uh, please unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Thank you. Um, I'm saying to you and to everybody else, thank you very much. Um, okay. Um, and uh, thanks to Ronnie, our 
our mentor and inspirer. And um, thanks to Cal for that. That was very inspiring too. Um, what I'd like to talk about is um, international solidarity then in the anti-apartheid struggle and some of the problems that arise with international solidarity now and what I would understand as being problems experienced by youth um, now and hopefully that might um, create some things for youth and students to think about because we have some very similar issues that were around then and that are around now. For example, we have uh, and had racism, gender equity issues, um, civil rights issues, including gay rights, sustainable development, inequality, poverty, uh, energy issues, climate change, more now, um, energy issues, rural development, environment, immigration, and so on. And like Noura said, like Ronnie said, um, we have to um, have international struggles. The world needs internationalism now more than ever. And it probably seems that um, many major um, achievements require transnational cooperation. We are a new age of internationalism um, and a new phase of internationalism. So going back to the anti-apartheid struggle, why did we attract internationalists? Well, probably our struggle seemed more clear cut at that point. Um, we were organized in the underground cell by cell on, on the above ground structures. We were also well organized and able to um, receive internationalists so that um, internationalists knew when they came in, if they wanted to work in the above wood structure, if they wanted to work in the underground, we were able to receive them and slot them in where they wanted to work. Now, today, where there are so many contemporary movements, both from the left and from the right, working, it can be confusing for people, um, for youth especially, where you have often divisive things happening. For example, often non-progressive forces are working with the same topics and the same elements of the agendas of progressive forces, for example, environment issues and gay rights issues. And this might be confusing, but the giveaway would surely be that often the non-progressive movements would be have very anti-migrant, uh, um, extreme views on migrants. And that surely can't be right because if you're working for human rights, how can you have a xenophobic approach? So I'd like to go on from there to the question of nationalism today and the rise of na ethnic nationalisms, which, and compare that again to how internationalists responded to the type of nationalism we spoke about. So you see now, and it's quite frightening, the rise of ethnic nationalism, often expansionist, frequently neo-Nazi. And where South Africa, spoke about a national democratic uh, revolution, often, I mean, in the context of Africa's resistance to colonial um, domination. And what we in South Africa argued resistance to internal colonialism. Internationalists could respond to that quite easily. 
because they saw the struggle as just. Back to the question of organization, I'd venture to say that today there might be a problem for internationalists with the question of structure and the problems with grassroots structures. It's easy for social movements everywhere to get um, people out on the streets with um, banners, placards, to go and listen to speeches about the environment. But when we talk about transnational movements, international movements, who do we leave the nitty gritty and the organization to? Do we leave it to the United Nations? Do we leave it to the corporates? Who organizes the structures in the schools and the universities and the civics? Who organizes in the way that, for example, the anti-apartheid movement used to work. Noor spoke about the BDS, but how effective is that now working internationally? Because if it was working with the strength of the anti-apartheid movement, we would have seen perhaps stronger movements in terms of sanctions by now on Palestine, we would have seen more toppling of the apartheid in Palestine. Now it's clearly possible because overnight there's been mass mobilization um, against uh, the attacks in Ukraine. So now what, what, what is going on there? Um, does it mean some issues are more important and why? Why is that? We have to look at that. Um, what is going on there? Why, why is there some sort of hierarchy of issues that people get involved in? A suggestion is that, well, we, the anti apartheid movement was dissolved, but a suggestion um, what about reigniting the structures of the anti-apartheid movement, but it's with youth, bringing youth into that movement in leadership positions with the experience of youth and the knowledge of youth, the knowledge of youth of Facebook, remember the Arab Spring, with Facebook, um, the technology, the understanding that as elders we can learn from. The, I, I just like to go back to South Africa again now. Recently in South Africa, well, I found on, on my emails an organization called the Anti-Racism Coalition is a big organization. And it, it wants to have um, an, an anti-racism anti activities on the 14th to the 21st of March. So it's sending out some ideas for what different organizations should do. And it's saying, can um, workplaces have discussion, organized discussions, can sports tournaments be held and so on. Now, if we hadn't dissolved the UDF in 1994, all of that would have been possible. The structures would have been in place. But how do we do that now? Like the rest of the world, we're good at putting people on the streets. Trade unions are good at putting people on the streets. People who want to protest against poor service delivery in South Africa are good at going on the streets. But in terms of real organization structures, 
have we got that possibility? And I would say in response to Ronnie, in response to Nur, and I totally agree that that's necessary, that world peace movement is necessary, but it's those structures, it's those detailed structures, those door-to-door -door structures, those nitty gritty structures in each and every, in each and every trade union, in each and every school, in each and every university, all linking together. That's what's necessary. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Muff. Um, before I hand over to uh, Ramsey, uh, can I ask participants, I know that some people have already put comments in the chat, but just to uh, yeah, encourage everyone to put their comments there and to ask the speakers to please have a look at what's being said there um, uh, while uh, we continue with the panel speakers. Over to you, Ramsey. Thanks very much for joining us. I know it's very early in the morning for you. Oh, it's, it's no problem. Uh, thank you uh, very much. And I hope that you like my setup there. I I'm, I'm excited about being here. Um, <clears throat> you know, for me, listening to all of this, and of course, reading the book and participating in the book, served more than just an opportunity to reflect on the past, because let's be honest here, South Africa's past is our present. And the current struggles in South Africa, and let's not undermine how enormous these struggles are from a socio-political level to actual political and fair political representation to equality in society to um, South Africa's geopolitical position vis-a-vis -vis the rest of Africa and the whole world are so many issues that South Africans have inherited and they are fighting for. For us Palestinians, that's going to be our future fight and our future cause. So being part of this, first of all, I am I'm absolutely proud um, to have been included with these true freedom fighters. Uh, and and, and just, it's just touching that there's under no circumstance will our comrades in South Africa and in all of Africa omit the Palestinian component uh, in their struggle. Uh, it's not sentiments. It's not an emotional drive. It's just something that actually uh, is part and parcel of that struggle. And, and in my chapter or, or my short essay in the book, I, I started by reflecting on, on the fact that when I first went to South Africa, I was approached by these two uh, South African men who came to thank me for the PLO's support and Palestine support for um, Af the South African anti-apartheid struggle uh, in, you know, from, the, from the very early process. And I was taken aback. I was surprised actually by all of this. I thought, yes, of course, we, we demonstrated uh, in, in, in my refugee camp in the Gaza Strip where I was born and raised. We, um, you know, we use such references as the Mandela of Palestine and we had pictures of Mandela and his comrades on our walls in the refugee camp, and it was a very important part of our political consciousness and awareness, uh, you know, generation after generation in Palestine. But actual Palestinian support of South Africa, tangible support, PLO support, Yasser Arafat uh, involvement, uh, uh, training camps happening in Algeria and that sort of thing, for me, that was quite surprising. And that was for me an, an, a process of learning uh, about, um, about the, the, a, different, a different take on the anti-liberation, uh, anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. And I say a different take, and, and I think this is important, is because here I'm in Seattle, Washington at the moment, and, and I remember, and I, I see everything every, every year, every time a South African uh, occasion is commemorated in the, in the global stage when uh, uh, Mandela passed away and all of this, how Western corporate media tries to depict the African struggle, the anti-apartheid struggle. It's absolutely strange how they have rewrote the narrative 
and the representation of that struggle. For us, Mandela is someone entirely different than the way he is portrayed in American media and Western media. He is not a, you know, this fuzzy, warm, you know, um, you know, Santa Claus kind of character that they portray him to be. He was a true freedom fighter. And yes, there were, you know, there was a massive component of that struggle that is armed struggle. And now you're not supposed to talk about it too much because it upsets a lot of people and it may uh, garner you uh, uh, the reputation of being too radical or, or you are hurting the sensibilities of Westerners and Europeans and Americans and so forth. So this is why for me, this book was an eye opener. That's a whole different discussion of South Africa. It's a discussion that emanates from the people of, of the country who participated in that struggle, but from the region itself that has embraced and, and, and supported and were punished as a result of being part of that struggle. You never hear this. You never hear what, you know, who are the African countries that supported South Africa? For me, it was kind of brand new knowledge because I was always under the impression, well, there is a global movement and the global movement involves all sorts of people from New Zealand to Australia, to, to uh, you know, uh, Britain, to the US. But the, the, the African component is quite often missing. And I am so happy to see that this book highlights it and places that struggle within, within the proper priorities, political and historical priorities. Um, as Palestinians, we are constantly looking at what's happening in South Africa now and what happened in the past. We're trying to learn, we are trying to decipher, decode, see what applies, what doesn't, what language to adopt, what doesn't, and that sort of thing. In fact, the issue of language in particular, and, and this is really, I promise, is not self-promotion, but the book that Ilan Pape and I are, you know, put together, our vision for liberation, there's a lot of discussions about the term liberation. National liberation has, you know, it's, it's not a topic that is, that is very popular at the moment. That is something that, you know, been folded with some other historical chapters and it's in the past now. But what do we do in Palestine? If what we are doing is not national liberation, anti-apartheid struggle, then what, it, what is it? Is it a state building? What state? We are not free. We are living in refugee camps. We are living in Bantu stands. We are being cut off from one another. We are living behind apartheid walls surrounded by, by fences everywhere we go. If this is not a national liberation struggle, then what is? So we are encouraged by the insistence of our South African comrades and our African comrades who insist on bringing this language back. It's not old language, it's not dead language, it's not irrelevant language. We need to use it. Now, one last thing, and, and I, I hope I'm not exceeding my time here. Um, right now, Africa is becoming even more relevant to Palestine than ever before. Let's not forget the centrality of, the, of, of Africa in shaping the global solidarity for Palestine everywhere. The BDS movement, maybe right now, there are major battles happening in Europe and in the US, but we really ought to look back at the 60s and 70s and remember that it was our African comrades who insisted on labeling Israel uh, and Zionism rather, uh, labeling Zionism uh, uh, a form of racism, linking that to what was happening in South Africa and what was happening in other African countries. And it, it was that decision by African countries at the time that, that pushed the General Assembly to eventually uh, accept that very definition, which sadly was, was turned back by the US under pressure. The General Assembly in the early 1990s said, no, Zionism ceases being a form of racism, despite the fact that Zionism is actually is, is uglier in its violent, racist apartheid manifestation today than it was ever before. 
So we need to reclaim that, not just reclaiming the language, but we need to reclaim the history and we need to reclaim the solidarity that we have with Africa. We need Palestine back at the heart of Africa, as opposed to Israel being an observer member of the African Union. There is something extremely ahistorical happening here, and it needs to stop. And, and, and I, am, I am again quite proud to see our South African brothers, South African government included, being on the forefront of pushing against any normalization of apartheid Israel in Africa. So once more, um, and as you can tell from my language, I am not talking about the past, I am talking about the very present, events that are happening, that happened just last week, this week, and next week. For us, this is very, very much relevant. South Africa, we are still living the certitude and racism and hardship that you have suffered under for so many years, we are living it in all of its ugly manifestations and we need it over and we need to stop this. So your fight, I'm sorry to say, it's not over yet. It's gonna carry on because as Mandela said, our freedom is not complete without the freedom of the Palestinians. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ramzi. Um... Unfortunately, I've been keeping an eye out for uh, James and Kulu, who uh, was our last panelist. But for those that uh, have joined us later, uh, he's had a, a family emergency to attend to and was hoping to join us uh, uh, later, but I see, see he still hasn't joined us. So let us take uh, um, a round of comments. Um, and questions from the audience. If anyone would like to, uh, to, to put a question or comments directly to the speakers, please uh, uh, use the raise hand uh, function and I'll, I'll ask you to, to unmute. I hope I can see the hands. Um, yeah, Rana, there's a hand from uh, Bob Newland. Uh, thanks, Njogu. Uh, uh, Bob, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, I see you've also put some comments in the chat, but go ahead. Okay, thanks very much, Ariana, and hello to everybody. I'll try and be brief. Ronnie mentioned two, two of the four pillars of struggle when he did his introduction. And one of the things I found in reading the book was that the book successfully demonstrated, I think, the way in which all of the uh, different uh, contributors to that struggle brought together all four pillars of the struggle. Uh, and that was a, a tremendous strength. As one of the London recruits, I was always embarrassed by the fact that our story uh, was based around the accident of recruitment in London. Um, and it excluded the contributions of so many others. And one of the great things about this book, of course, is that that corrects that omen. Um, so much better the story is for it. We decided, some of us quite reluctantly, as Ronnie has expressed in the contributors to this book, uh, to share our experiences, not from hubris, but to uh, encourage international solidarity among others, to make it a, a positive uh, uh, word and an idea at a time when it was under challenge and threat uh, more than 10 years ago now, but ongoing too. And I'm sure that was uh, the reason for some of the other contributors. One of the things the book I felt did also uh, show was the complexity of solidarity between combatants from South Africa, Angola, Mozambique, Palestine, Ireland, and the Basque country. Uh, the interrelationship between the individuals and the uh, framework of that uh, struggle. And I hope I'm not stealing Ronnie's thunder uh, for his finishing, but I think it's worth drawing attention to a quote uh, from a Basque uh, combatant uh, from Urku in his contribution in the book, when he says that solidarity is the tenderness amongst people. I think that's such a beautiful picture of the idea of solidarity. And uh, finally, I would uh, like to thank Ronnie and all those involved uh, for the extraordinary privilege to be able to have been a part of 
the struggle for the liberation of South Africa. I hope we are able to see more people becoming engaged in that with Palestine, or the other people still uh, suffering under imperialism in the world today. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thanks very much to, to uh, Bob for your uh, contribution to the discussion. And um, um, is there any more hands? I saw, uh, the, I mean, uh, there was a question around international distribution of the book uh, that was asked that uh, uh, Ronnie may be able to answer. And then uh, a comment by Jenny Schreiner. I'm not sure if she's still in the meeting around the importance of, solid, of international solidarity in the um, current context of the, of the war in the Ukraine. Um, uh, there's been a comment, uh, you know, emphasizing again the significance of, uh, of uh, African solidarity um, for the anti-apartheid struggle. Um, and I thought that Ramsey's comments in relation to the historical role of, uh, you know, the organization of African um, uh, unity and then the African Union in the struggle against apartheid and what's happening um, at the AU today with Israel uh, being granted observer status is obviously uh, an important uh, comment. Um, I don't know if any of the other panelists would like to respond to any of the issues that have been raised, um, you know, by other participants or by other speakers. You you can go ahead and unmute yourselves. Um, hey, hello, can you hear me? I'm Eddie Donnelly. Oh, hi, we hear you. Right. Hi, um, Eddie Donnelly. Hi, Eddie, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've been listening with... Uh, Great interest to the webinar and congratulations to everybody who organized it. I've yet to read the book. I had difficulties getting it in the UK. So thanks to Bob for you know, giving us a tip as to where to acquire it. Um, I was struck by um, comments made by Murph um, and I wrote two phrases down. One was about, well, to paraphrase, one was about moral clarity and the other one was about a hierarchy of issues. And I think they're very important in my personal story about um, why I got involved uh, actively uh, as a Brit um, through uh, family friendship with uh, the casuals, actually. Um, and uh, my contribution is very small, very minor. Uh, and I was, I was gonna stay silent, but um, you've, uh, you, um, you've encouraged me to speak uh, about this a bit. My personal story, I, I, there's one thing I want to say here about my personal involvement. Um, what triggered it? You know, it's all about the trigger, what motivates you as somebody outside of a country to get involved in what's going on inside another country. And for me, um, to no surprise to many, I guess, in the UK, it was Thatcher. Uh, that is the premiership of Margaret Thatcher in the 80s. And we've had the miners' strike going on. Um, but also, she, I re distinctly remember, and Ronnie will be interested in this, I was driving down the Holloway Road in London uh, with crowds of Arsenal fans on their way to a football match, whilst listening on radio, on, on, on BBC Radio, to uh, Margaret Thatcher speaking out in Parliament and condemning the South African uh, freedom fighters as terrorists. And for me personally, that was the trigger. And I guess if I wanted to make a bigger point around that, I, I, I wonder whether there's any mileage in exploring the relationship between what's going on domestically in a country and um, you know what's going on in the in, in the in the other country. So in my case, you know, it's domestic politics as much as the international solidarity, as much as belonging to anti-apartheid and joining this protest and that protest. 
that was the trigger that was the moral clarity for me these were not terrorists these were freedom fighters with a just cause and that was the personal trigger for me to say with this i will not put up and that motivated me to seek out more involvement and uh, i didn't have to look far because i worked with eleanor uh, in the same uh, institution so that was my personal statement thank you very much Thanks very much, Eddie, for sharing that and, your, and parts of your story. Um, I, I see Ken Kibo uh, would like to speak. Please go ahead, Ken. So sorry, I thought I was uh, <laughs> speaking there. I'll start again. Um, I, I went into South Africa in 1968 when I was 23 years old, and again in 1970. Uh, and Ronnie was Ronnie Casriel, of course, who sent me in there. I want to say a word about international solidarity. Um, when we strike a blow against uh, apartheid in South Africa, when we did that, we were also striking a blow against the British capitalist class and the British capitalist state. And that was my motivation, because I understand it at a higher level now than I did at the time. But um, I think that point is very important to make. It was Britain which established, which established the Union of South Africa on a basis of institutional racism, thereby creating the basis for apartheid later on. Uh, and Britain, uh, the British capitalist state, could have withdrawn Put, could have pulled the rug from under the apartheid regime at any time that it wanted to um, because of the enormous uh, power of investment and so on uh, and, and because of the political support which Britain had indeed given to the apartheid regime. So that, that's my attitude to international solidarity. Um, it's uh, rather different from the one that's been quoted, um, uh, you know, which is a little bit on the sentimental side. It's, it's um, it's, it's in the interest of, of every every worker in the world and every progressive in the world to fight against the capitalist states, their own capitalist state. And that's what I was doing. Fighting against the apartheid in South Africa was secondary to fighting against the common enemy of the British uh, working class and the British and the South African people against the British capitalist and imperialist state. Thank you very much, everybody. It's a great book. Uh, don't forget my book. Uh, London recruits the secret war against apartheid. Thank you. Thank you, Ken, um, about reminding us uh, of the importance of the inter interconnectedness of, of, of struggles. Um, there's been another comment in the chat around how uh, BDS and international solidarity have um, being critical in shifting the discourse on Israel as an apartheid state. And uh, we should probably mention the recent uh, report by Amnesty International in this respect. Uh, this is the last organization to, to define Israel as an apartheid state. Um, anyway, Shireen says, um, increasing number of artists and academics are boycotting. While the immorality of apartheid was very clear, BDS has to fight against the Zionist narrative, which has been the dominant narrative, unable to present itself as victim. And then another comment from Polly Gassa around the issue of today's language and um, and uh, euphemisms and generalities um, uh, that are used not to uh, offend. Um, I don't know if anyone would like to respond from the panel. Um, Rani, uh, shall we start uh, with you again and, and we'll, we'll, we'll just go again in the same order as you spoke? <coughs> sure. Thank I'm you. very much up to that, and um, I'll certainly uh, not deal with everything and hog the show. <laughs> we do need to spread it out. I, I think all those contributions are extremely relevant indeed. Um, I want to just mention uh, Bob Newland, dear old friend and uh, internationalist, she had many 
dangerous times together, served his time in South Africa, waiting on a seashore in the trans sky to receive uh, guerrilla MK combatants from Somaliland, uh, having been trained in the Soviet Union. Um, and of course, they, they never landed. That's another story. Snookies and Kalala's present. And, uh, you know, there's so much that needs to be stated about the incredible commitment of MK cadres in the struggle and the support they received from the internationalists, which the book looks at. But just to say to him, in terms of quoting um, that uh, solidarity is the tenderness we owe to others, funnily enough, Urko Ayerta from the Basque country was just with us until Sunday, and he was with me until that day. We had a very nice little gathering um, and Ramsey will be interested to know this with comrades of the BDS group and um, Palestinians discussing their struggle and how vital the Palestinian struggle is in the world today. It's the absolute keynote struggle and replicates so clearly as, as Ramsey so powerfully put it, the apartheid issue of today. And we have to really ignite BDS solidarity um, that fourth pillar of the struggle that Bob Newland refers to, political struggle, mass struggle, uh, politics must lead, the organization of the masses, the trade unionists, the grassroots that Muff refers to. This, these are what the ANC and the Alliance came to see as being the vital aspect. It, it's the political struggle of the people. Our reinforcement of that with the other pillars was the underground struggle, the armed struggle with reinforced it. It wasn't a leading element as say in countries like Cuba or Vietnam uh, and elsewhere in Africa too. Uh, and then international solidarity, so key to all such struggles and so vital. And it was Urko spoke about um, the best comrade who perished in the struggle against the fascist US-backed regime in Salvador back in the 80s. And that quote comes from a beautiful letter he wrote. Uh, his name was Paquito. And he wrote this to his mother back in the Basque country about um, why he was there, what solidarity was all about. And it comes down to these human feelings, just as solidarity is so, all embracing in such a universal sense with all the factors of what we fight for, what the just cause is about, how it's able to unify people right across all the borders of the world and all the continents. Mandela had said in speaking to a meeting of the internationalists in uh, 1992, 91 or 92 in Tanzania, that it was the people of the five continents uh, who had come to our assistance and that bedrock that Oliver Tambo referred to. So I wanted to just take up that issue, Ariana, from, um, from, from Bob and the four pillars and Ramsey Barut's impassioned uh, issues of Palestine and BDS. But um, I can't but help paying tribute to Polly Gaster, who has given her life to the struggle for Africa. I met her a long, long time ago during the anti-apartheid movement and MAGIC, which was the solidarity movement for, for Mozambique, Angola, Guinea-Bissau, Cape Verde, and of course the champion of solidarity, um, Amilcar Cabral, who she referred to in an earlier message to us, never to be forgotten, and how he championed and saw international solidarity as absolutely central to all struggles for real justice, liberation, freedom, etc. Uh, and of course, that anti-colonialist struggle. I'll leave others to perhaps come in on her question about the euphemistic and generalizations of language. I, I don't particularly like um, um, 
aspects of how the big speak has been referred to in, in history in Orwell's books in 1984, etc. Uh, and he certainly played a very reactionary role when he was clearly, as has come out, in league with the British intelligence. Uh, but he had a great deal to say about how language was so crucial to oppression, to falsehoods, and so on. And we need to interrogate that factor very, very deeply. I'm, I'm not going to go much further than that, Polly, if you'll forgive me, because I'm taking up too much time. But I just, Ariana, I want to come back to what Ramsey Barut had to say, uh, just as, as, as something further to what Polly's question is, the way Nelson Mandela, who was demonized as a terrorist, along with the ANC and Communist Party in our struggle against the apartheid and all the forces struggling against apartheid, how he was demonized as a terrorist and how, and we need to take this into account in the world today and in what NATO's business is all about, what United States imperialism is all about, what the BBC, the CNN, Sky News echoed in South African media, because we, we don't have people on the ground in, in the Ukraine theater, for example. It's just reflected in the kind of way they have turned Mandela into a Santa Claus figure, the way Jesus Christ, who was a rebel, um, how he was turned into a Santa Claus, and the way that they absolutely falsify what is going on in the world, which leads us to such crimes uh, that we, we witness over and over again, and how we must learn from history. That's why history is an absolute living necessity to understand what came before, to go back to the Second World War, to the creation of NATO, to the way in which the Western powers are conniving with Israel to keep the Palestinians down. So these are the lost people whose, who, who, whose narrative we must fall for. That's my little bit. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Rani. Uh, Riaz, would you like to come in? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Ariana. You know, uh, obviously, the, the questions and, and, and the comments that have been made are extremely pertinent. Uh, maybe I did not address the current challenges that we have. I tried to put the historical context to what we were doing. But uh, in many ways, you know, uh, the liberation of our country in South Africa cannot and must never be the end of, of our efforts to, to contribute to, to international solidarity. Uh, I mean, struggles evolve all the time. And maybe, and I'm just putting it out there, we need to start looking at how do we develop new forms of struggle. You know, the anti-apartheid movement and international progressive forces. You know, how do we reinvent our modus operandi of resistance uh, to the challenges uh, that we are faced with right now? You know, issues around climate change, youth issues, gender-based issues, food security, geopolitical conflict. Those are issues that we've got to deal with. But the two are not mutually exclusive. We've also got to understand the historical challenges. Palestine is still there. Uh, the Polisario Front struggle is still there. Many other liberation movements are still fighting for self-liberation. So we've got to reinvent how we view the historical context within the current context. And we've got to make sure that we develop and evolve forms of struggle that will address specific challenges, yet allow us a golden thread to, to unite the kind of progressive forces that we saw in the earlier days, in the 60s, in the 70s, which led to the liberation of, of many countries. So, you know, I, I do think maybe there has to be a discourse, uh, a, a, a a, a, a contextual understanding of are we really addressing to the best of our ability intellectually and otherwise and practically uh, of, of have we optimized our ability to, to face these challenges? Uh, and of course, this again, I say, does not detract from, from, from what Ramsey was saying about we need to confront right now the challenges that we're faced with. 
So, you know, again, I mean, history, we've got to learn from history. We will not in many instances be able to take up arms in, in certain environments. We will not be able to fight just wars in other environments, but we've got to find different ways of confronting the modern challenges that we're faced with at the moment. And those challenges have not gone in terms of self-determination of liberation, uh, but they, they just reinforce our ability to understand that it is a continuum. And, and that's why a book like this is so important. It gives us an idea of how to understand the past, but to chart a way forward in terms of addressing the challenges that humanity have so that we can contribute as well as our compatriots in the past have done to, to the future of, of this world that we live in. Thanks. Um, Mafa, over to you. Oh, okay, I'd just like to comment on two things. The one is Ed's point about um, internal dynamics and external things at the same time. And the one example I would see now is Boris Johnson's problems with partying at the same time as the Ukraine issue erupting. And I think he must be totally delighted to have Ukraine on his doorstep taking away from um, his problems at home, because um, it's like a bit like, the, it reminds me of the, the movie Wag the Dog. Um, I don't know if anybody's seen that, but it's uh, with Robert De Niro, I think it was Robert De Niro. Um, it, it totally detracts. Um, and uh, I, I think we, we need to, we need to look at those kind of things, like he mentioned Thatcher and so on. Um, but there's a lot of that stuff going. There's a lot of that stuff going on when you've got problems at home. Just have a little war somewhere else, or get involved in a little war somewhere else, and uh, or a big war, and even a world war, and um, your problems at home are sort of very small in comparison. So that's one thing. The second thing is on Polly Gaster's issue um, about, uh, she, she spoke about um, what, what do the panelists think about, um, let me just find it here. Um, what do panelists think about, uh, let me just read it. What do panelists think about the issue of uh, today's language, she says, I think it's very important, euphemisms and general generalities and not offending anyone. Well, I I agree with her. There's, there's something going on about the sanitizing of language. And um, you see it quite a lot in social media and um, like, don't be a hater, don't just look at your stream and all that kind of stuff. And um, I think it's, it's very difficult often to just use strong language um, to, to say things as they are, to, to, um, to describe the world as it is. Um, is there is in terms of politics um, a um, a sort of breaking down or almost like protection, a cocooning of um, of some of the issues that are really really hard, and it it really doesn't have to be there. I mean, we can we can bring back vocabularies that, that we've always used. We, we don't have to succumb to that. That's all I have to say. Thanks a lot, uh, Muff. Um, before I turn over to you, uh, Ramsey, I don't know if you saw there's an additional comment that you may want to respond to from Stephen Norgard. 
about um, what progressive Jewish South Africans uh, should do in support of a Palestinian struggle um, and how, um, how the conflict is often, often uh, portrayed as one uh, between religions. So you may want to respond to that comment. Also, just to note, there was a comment from Snooki Zikalala, um, just paying tribute to the international comrades and additional comments from Bob Newland and Ken, Ken Kibble, I'll let you uh, read those, but over to you, Ramsey. Um, thank you. Um, and thank you to the previous speakers and, and the excellent points that were made. Really, there's so much food for thought here. I think, I think it's, well, we are aware of the fact that it's essentially the people struggle on the ground that will make all the difference at the end of the day. You can't do this in isolation. International solidarity, and again, I mentioned it earlier, it was mentioned again, it's not a sentimental issue. It is a strategy, and it's a very important component of that strategy. If a people are being uh, demonized, isolated, uh, uh, you know, living in, in walls and, 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 and bantu stands and in, in, in complete, uh, uh, like in Gaza, for example, what is referred to as the world's largest open air prison. You don't know what's happening there. They can't reach you. They can't talk to you. Well, you can do whatever you want to them. And that's what Israel has been counting on over the years. There are two Israels, the same way that there were two South African apartheid regimes. The one that speaks to the international community uh, and, the, and, and, and it portrays itself in any way it wants using its access, control, power, and influence on the global stage, media, etc., and the reality that is happening on the ground. International solidarity allows a, a struggling nation to break the walls that are separating it from the rest of the world. That is the exposure that will make all the difference as far as pressure from the outside is concerned. Israel will never relent the same way that South, South African apartheid never relented without it being exposed for what it was. This is why when Amnesty International came up with its report about Israeli apartheid, it was earth shattering in many ways. Yes, Human Rights Watch has done the same thing. Even Israel's largest human rights group, uh, uh, Beit Salem has done the same thing last year. But what is happening here is that these are the liberal human rights organizations that spoke for Palestinian rights, but all, almost always in a very cautious language. And that's where the element of language comes in always in, a, in creating moral equivalence. Israel shouldn't be doing this, but the Palestinians shouldn't be doing this either. So at the end of the day, if you are an outsider listening to all of this, you could come with the conclusion that this is a troubled place. People are fighting. Some, some say they've been fighting for thousands of years over religions, not realizing that this is actually a modern political conflict that is a result of British uh, uh, colonialism and, and consequently Zionist colonialism in Palestine as early as 1917 and, and when Israel was established in 1948. When Amnesty did so, it challenged, it kind of like the last wall that protected Israel is now, is now taken down. And now we can actually say we ha have a new language. We have new definitions and that new definition is now a, a, a leading word, word amongst it is the word apartheid. We can actually say not allegedly apartheid Israel, not what Palestinians and their supporters claim to be apartheid Israel, but rather what international human rights organizations call apartheid Israel. Now it's not over yet. We need to we need to confirm that definition at the human rights the UN Human Rights Council, eventually at the General Assembly. And, and with the hope that eventually the tide, and it will, and the tide will be turned against Israel. So we are in a situation, I really think, and I'm really not just trying to kind of just push kind of random optimism here. I really think that we are finally on that path that South Africa has taken uh, many, many years ago. 
And I want to remind our friends in Palestine and Palestine solidarity activists, be patient. The, fa the fight for South Africa didn't start in the 50s and 60s. South Africa was under colonial regimes that have lasted for hundreds of years. Another thing, that, that's one thing that the book highlighted that was very beneficial to me is the fact that solidarity coming from African American uh, communities and leaders began in the late 19th century. That was a brand new piece of information. That was decades after black people were allowed to sit on the front of the bus. They still showed solidarity uh, and, 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 and stood in solidarity with their brethren in South Africa. So the issue of language is very, very important. Don't shy away from pushing new language. Don't shy away from challenging mainstream media narratives and definitions. Uh, but also remember that at the end of the day, we are all interconnected. No, no conflict happens in isolation. Uh, the isolation is the only thing that the colonialist wants to achieve. But the colonized wants to break that isolation and connect to the rest of the world. And very, very quickly regarding progressive Jews, our movement is incomplete without you. Because number one, we need to make sure that, that it is understood that this is not a religious conflict. We are not fighting our, against our Jewish comrades and brothers and sisters anywhere in the world. You are part of that movement. We need you to be part of that movement like everybody else, but you also have that essential role to play because we do plan, believe it or not, to coexist in Palestine as equals. And that coexistence is not complete without having Palestinian Jews who are living with us, who have lived in Palestine for hundreds of years prior to the establishment of Israel to continue to live peacefully with their Palestinian brothers, Christians and Muslims. So it's important now, but it's even more important in the future. And that's a very, very important point that we constantly try to highlight, not as part of any sort of propaganda, because this is the reality. This is the truth. Palestine needs all of its people, Muslims, Christians and Jews, to live together as equal. No walls, no racism, no racial hierarchy whatsoever. Thank you, Ramzi. Uh, I, um, I was checking to see if there's any final comments or, um, yeah, you may want to uh, just check the discussion in the chat, but that just sharing some information um, about organizations and initiatives uh, in support of uh, Palestine in South Africa. Um, I can't see any additional hands or comments. So I'm just giving a last opportunity to raise questions or comments for the panel. Otherwise, I think we can, we can wrap it up here. Um, it's been a really uh, important and powerful discussion. Um, just a comment from Ken Keeble alerting that the film London Recruits, uh, which has been in the making for a number of years, uh, is finally nearly complete. So uh, we look forward to that and hope that we can meet again um, on, on uh, occasion of its first viewing in South Africa. Um, uh, I don't know if there are any final comments from Ronnie, uh, Riaz, Mafo, Ramsey. Otherwise, I'd like to thank you all and thank you to all the. Uh, I see Ronnie, yes. Okay, Go thanks. Ahead. Good to hold up proceedings, um, Ariana. Um, just to say, in response to this cardinal issue of boycott, divestment, sanctions against Israel to isolate Israel the way Pretoria was isolated in the anti apartheid struggle. Um, Ken and Bob Newlands have both made the point about how the struggle to free Palestine from colonial settler imperialist back regime is part of the global struggle against tyranny everywhere to free people and the book itself now just ending on that uh, we haven't had much input about the actual details in the contributions from those who were engaged in the clandestine struggle, uh, but they they full of what international solidarity and commitment is all about. 
and what motivated those who joined the very dangerous um, mission of supporting the South African underground struggle in, in Umkonto with Siswe. Um, just to also perhaps end on a question that had been raised several times where people can obtain the book, they will see that uh, Faroz Mandia has made reference there to the publishing that he's taking up from his publishing house in, in Canada linked to Africa in Kenya. Uh, um, Jakana have all the information that's needed about the worldwide distribution. And out of Britain, um, at the Merlin Press, which also goes under the name of Global uh, Distributors of Books, that is central to the distribution um, from, from Britain itself, throughout Britain. Problem, of course, is the excise duty that given Brexit, the brilliance of Brexit, has added to those having to purchase books outside. But um, Ireland, which is a great anti-imperialist, has, has that anti-imperialist tradition, will be able to get books through Northern Ireland and Muff Oscar, who's a co-editor and myself, will actually be touring uh, we're visiting London later in a couple of months and also Ireland. So the book's um, creating great interest everywhere and goes in tandem with the initial London recruits and now the film on the London recruits, which will generate much more interest in relation to the international solidarity that was shown in the struggle to liberate South Africa and needs to be replicated for Palestine and everywhere else in the world where people are fighting against imperialism, neo-colonialism, racism, and so on. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Um... Rania, I see there's more info about the distribution uh, in the chat, but let me thank you um, all again, Rani, uh, Riaz, um, Maf, and, and Ramzi uh, for your contribution today and congratulations on a wonderful book um, that I hope will inspire us and, and, and strengthen our um, uh, resolve to act in solidarity with others today, particularly given uh, Ramsey's uh, powerful words uh, in relation to the Palestinian struggle today. So thank you again. And um, it was a pleasure to host you. I don't know um, if, if you'd like to sort of say hi to old comrades and, and uh, you, you're very welcome to do that, to unmute yourself and, and chat. But otherwise, I will end it here. Thank you, Ariana. Thank, Thank you, you. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Ramsey. Thank you. <laughs> Let's hope we continue the conversation soon. Thank you. Thank you, Birgit. Thanks, everyone. Um, Thank you, Ariana. I'll put Thanks up a much. recording, I'll, I'll share it with all of you. Uh, I'll put up a recording on YouTube so that will be accessible after, af afterwards in the next few days. Thanks again, have a good evening. Same to you, <laughs> bye.